All right, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your grace and mercy that has kept us alive in the devil's world, not allowed us to be destroyed and our minds wiped out and so many wonderful things you've done for us. You actually allow us to prosper spiritually, emotionally, mentally, do well, to live a life of purpose and meaning, a life of happiness. Thank you for that. Father, I'm still striving in my own life to find that simplicity of just seeing your promises and principles that make us who we are so that I can be joyful consistently. Pray that you give us insight about all this today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're talking in Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 about joy. You know, this is the spiritual growth passage. So we're, we're in a discussion on joy and contentment. And I've taken every opportunity along the way to stop and discuss different aspects of this spiritual growth. And next we're going to get into the supremacy of Christ. And that's going to be a fantastic discussion. But right now we're talking about joy and contentment. Now, if you got the message, if you got the notes from arministry.net, then you didn't get this spectrum. But but happiness is experienced on a spectrum from, I'm trying to show you, from misery over here to full happiness over here. So the worst you can feel is totally, totally miserable. And the best you can feel is like a celebration. You're overjoyed. And, and we're all somewhere in between that line, the, that there's a line, you know, and there, it's like a gauge. So the question is, where are you on that line right now? I mean, are you really sad or miserable or, or dejected, discouraged? Uh, it's easy to be that because we're so tied in to the things of this world, the things of this life, you know, that so, well, nothing's really wrong, but none of the things that I wanted from my life have worked out. So I find myself to be kind of down overall in my life, kind of down. And I can relate to that. Some of us are, have a temperament that way. Uh, my wife tells me that's my temperament. It's kind of, you know, er, you know, just serious and got to get there and something. I don't know. But I'm learning to let those things go so that I can just sit with the Lord and be joyful. So you're somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, at any point in life, people's emotional status is somewhere along on this gauge, on this line. You're either totally miserable or somewhere in between there and, and, uh, and overjoyed. And overjoyed would be like, you know, the Lord just came back. Uh, Paul was overjoyed because of other people's spiritual successes. When they grew spiritually, when they had victories in their life, he was overjoyed. Uh, so Paul, I mean, uh, James says to count it all joy. When you're going through things in your life, knowing they're going to produce growth. So let's just develop this out a bit. We're all born with this empty place in our core, and it produces a hunger. A hunger and thirst for love, intimacy, and I don't mean sex intimacy. I just mean closeness with somebody, being completely open and honest with somebody. We have a strong hunger to have someone in our life with whom we can be completely open, you know, completely real. We have no need to pretend to keep things hidden. Someone with whom you can be completely open. That is a, that's what I mean by intimacy. We need a sense of security and connection with others. And this is found in John 7, 37 through 39, which we've talked about. Now, God designed us to need him. He's the one ultimately with whom we must connect this inner place for us to be complete, fulfilled, happy, joyful have a celebration. He is the celebration. And it's not just him personally, it's the connection that he is willing to have with us. That, that listen, that, that he already has made that connection with us, but we're just not aware of it. 
Our mind is so set and preoccupied with so many other things but him, besides him, that we don't really realize who we are in Christ, what he's already done for us, what he's already given us, and this connection that we have with him. It says we grow spiritually as we stop focusing on the earthly things. We stop counting prosperity and connection as in, as in earthly possessions. You know, we need a new car. I want to make sure that I have enough money to to retire on, et cetera, et cetera. You know, well, I don't have I don't have a retirement program, so you know I can't be blessed yet. I can't relax yet. I've got to keep driving until I get that set up. See, those are just distractions. None of that's true. God's got this thing, and the rest, listen, the, the, the cares and worries of the world are simply illusions and distractions to choke out the Word of God in your life. That's what happened to the, the thorny soil. You know, the, the rocky soil, it just didn't grow at all. The birds ate it. You know, then you had the soil that uh, there was three, two other soils, one was the thorny soil. I can't remember the other one, but the two soils, they grew up. Hey, Roger. And, you know, the, the plant grew, but it didn't reach maturity because it got choked out. It got distracted. So that's what the cares and worries of life do. It keep us from really realizing who we are in Christ and, and what he thinks about us and the connection and the relationship that we have, that we already have. I used to think that I was trying to pursue God to have a greater relationship. The truth was that I already had that. He'd already given me that at salvation. See, he gives us everything that we need or ever will need in this life at the point of salvation. And many things for eternity. We already have those things. They're already in our inventory of assets. They're in the bank, and yet we don't know it. We're too preoccupied with blessings that look like physical, earthly attainments. Now, God designed us to need him, not the stuff. And he is the one who can fill our hearts, and, and to a lesser degree, other people. Possessions have nothing to do with our needs, although we do get confused about that and attach our desire and our beliefs to things of the world, you know, like a nice fishing boat or something. But Thirdly, there is an unconditional happiness that comes from the spiritual life as you begin to reach mature status. As you start moving into the mature levels of the Christian life, just through being steady, continuing to learn and be, and be faithful to inhale the Word and struggle in your life to exhale the Word, to live it out, to apply it to yourself, to work on your own character, to work on your own beliefs, to begin to take your take your old belief system apart so that you can see what's what makes you tick and you can change all those things to be righteous. These this is what makes you grow, you know, and this and there's a joy that comes from being on that journey and knowing you're on that journey and knowing you're on the right journey. There's a wonderful joy that comes from that. You know, it's not that you've completed it or you're finished or you've, I think, I truly believe that, that we've been sold the idea that this life somewhere, somehow is supposed to have some consummation, that that there's a purpose and an, and an end to it that's, that is all the result of our hard work and we get to the end of it and it's like, okay, now I see what it's all been about. Well... I don't know that that's how it works. I do know that we continue to strive to glorify the Lord, to grow within ourselves, and then we pass into the next life. So there is no earthly specific goals. I have to think about it, pray about it. If, you, if I'm wrong about that, you let me know. So fourthly, there's a conditional human happiness. See, there's a spiritual happiness that comes from just knowing who you are, who you're in, the journey that you're on, realizing that this, this, hey, Connie, uh, this is, you're, you're in the right track. You're on the right track for eternity. I mean, Jesus, 
to know that you're on the right track for eternity. That's pretty strong medicine. But there's also a conditional human happiness that it's HH on your paper that humans enjoy regardless of their spiritual status. You know, there are people are people and people strive for happiness. They all, every one of us, it's a universal desire is to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. And so we pursue it as human beings in many different ways. Human happiness comes from getting what you want, you know, and it's very temporary. It's a fleeting thing. You know, it lasts for a night and the next day you're like, what's next? Uh, but it's a human happiness that in, that, that humans enjoy regardless of spiritual status, generally based on circumstances. You know, your kid, your kid's team uh, went to the state and won the, the state soccer tournament. You know, we had that a couple of times where our kids did that. And that was, that was a truly joyful moment, you know. It was like it lasted all day. We, they worked hard all year, you know, and they got to this point and they won the state. It's like, wow, that was great. You know, we were very proud of them, and they were proud of themselves, and it was a good thing. But, you know, lasted a day or so, and then we're back to business. What's next? You know, that's how I think about it. All right, we've accomplished that. We got that feeling out of the way. What's next? So that's human happiness. Human happiness is generally based on our relationships, circumstances, and situations. Like marriage, success, wealth, health, freedom, these types of things. Human happiness is based on immediate, conditional situations. It's always temporary, causing the feeling of human happiness to go up and down. Now, this temporary, conditional emotion and feeling is what we drive ourselves crazy to obtain, rather than the spirit life, which is a permanent, under undergirding of your life, the joy, uh, uh, like a like a base that's built under you, of confidence and certainty, of where you're headed and what your life's about. We would rather pursue this temporary. You know, it's like eating. Yeah, uh, it's like eating candy bars all the time. You know, you get this temporary feeling of joy from that taste, but it, it does nothing for you. And then you know. You got to do it again to get the taste again and do it again to get the taste again. When in reality, if you were eating spiritual food and drinking living water from the Lord, you'd be getting a completely different experience, a more permanent, enduring, you know, steady, stable kind of joy that didn't go away, that stayed. So human, human happiness is based on Virtues of compassion, giving, integrity, honor, and stability that produces a more stable. Now, see, that what I'm saying here is there's a more stable, there's, there's a kind of human happiness that's just based on the moment. But there's a more stable type of human happiness where you succeed at something. You work hard for years and you finally reach a place. You know, you raise your kids and you see them do well. That's a stable kind of, of joy, of contentment, or, or whatever you want to call that, where you see the, the fruit of your labors, and it's done well. And you did well, and they're doing well. And that's a good thing. That's a good human happiness, better than the, just the frivolous, you know, your horse came in first. Uh, and now that, you know, you, you, you won that horse race and you made a hundred bucks and now you've already spent it, you know, at the restaurant and the bar. So there's all that's gone, you know, or whatever your type temporary type of pleasure is. But this type of happiness is stable, you know, and it's a good thing. It's not a wrong thing. It's just not a spiritual thing. And it won't last. Spiritual happiness or plus age sharing the happiness of God, is available to believers only. Unbeliever can't, can't share with plus age. And it's a joy. And joy, joy is only for those who are growing. You listen, the reversionistic or just a passive believer has no joy because they're still caught up and preoccupied with all their problems. 
their problems are really opportunities. But, you know, hey, Gene, you know, we call them problems where they're really opportunities. Spiritually advancing believers, those believers that are growing in the Lord, learning the word, living the word, struggling, you know, in areas where this is where the word is not working, knowing we're not working the word properly. So we figure out what are we doing? What are we thinking and believing instead of trusting the Lord? This is a spiritually advancing believer. They, they, listen, as a spiritually advancing believer, you can have human happiness. That's fine. Human happiness is a good thing. It's a normal thing. But the, those who pursue human happiness will never have spiritual happiness. But those who pursue spiritual happiness can also enjoy human happiness. Your football team wins. Hooray. You know? Uh, Gene Wilson's own and Jeannie Wilson's own and uh, hey Jeannie I hope you're feeling better and Auburn wins you know touchdown Auburn and uh, you know and they feel a, a big smile and they're happy for a moment and that's a good thing you can do that as a believer but the person who pursues human happiness as a believer they don't end up with joy so human happiness is temporary based on desirable circumstances Plus H, or, or sharing God's happiness, uh, is an enduring state of security, confidence, contentment, and peacefulness. So which one do you want? Which one are you going to pursue? Because if you pursue the Lord, you'll end up with this peaceful, contented joy. Also be able to have the human happiness that we all want to have, that God designed us to have. Now let's talk about sharing God's happiness because that's what we really want to get into. Now, in eternity past, you got to look at the Trinity. The Trinity is the key to a lot of, of all relational issues, the way they relate to one another. Unconditional, everything's by grace. It's just pure giving, no expecting, no demanding, just freedom to give as you desire, as you feel led to give, freedom to give. No expectations for you to give. No need for you to give. Because you know that what you need is already there. You already have what you need. See, when you realize that you already have what you need, or, or whatever you do, you're going to need, God is already sending on the way then you stop thinking about it that way. You stop worrying and concerning yourself with, are we going to have enough? You get this principle in your mind, and I taught it this morning and we'll teach it maybe today. You always have enough to do what God wants you to do today. Always. To think that you don't have enough or won't have enough is inconceivable. It's literally inconceivable. I know a lot of people are fearful about that. They, they pinch every penny. They, they're careful about everything. And that's, that's fine. Listen, being good stewards is a good thing. But check your motives. If you're being a good steward because you're afraid that you're not going to have enough, then you don't understand God's promise. Thanks, Deb. Uh, you don't understand the promise. You don't understand God's system. God has promised to provide everything you need to do his will one day at a time. Not tomorrow. You have everything you need today to do God's will. Once you adjust to that way of thinking and you stop worrying about tomorrow, let alone worrying about the next 40 years of your life, you know, the savings program so that when you're 40 years from now, you're going to have everything you need. I mean, okay, that's fine. I don't think God's opposed to that. That's just smart. But that should never be. You should do that stuff and just quit thinking about it because your issue is doing God's will today. Now, this moment, right now, are you doing God's will this moment? So, yeah, we're listening, you know, okay, all right. 
what are you going to do with what you hear today? Are you going to try to put it to use? Are you going to try to put it to practice? If you're in our if you're in our Wednesday night class, you're really being challenged to put that into practice because that study is not meant to just be another study. That study is meant to be applied. You know, that study is really meant to be done in a group setting where you can help each other and connect with each other and discuss with each other and Rattel and I are going to try to figure out a way to do that, perhaps, uh, online. Maybe make little groups or something where people can talk and discuss and help each other. It's really one of the great benefits of, of Christian uh, fellowship is the ability to discern the problems that others are having and to be able to offer encouragement, to even confront it's a wonderful thing. So, the Trinity, back to the Trinity. You know, the way they treat each other. God is complete within himself. He doesn't need anything. Now, that's an amazing thing about God. It's not the way we are. Hello, Glenda. How you doing, darling? God is complete and fulfilled within himself at all times. He always has been. You know, for all eternity, God has been God. He's never needed anything. And therefore, it's, it's relatively simple for God to give unconditionally. In fact, he, he has created, he's the one that came up with the idea because humans aren't capable of coming up with the idea of grace, of unconditional love. Because you know why? Because humans have needs. And those needs are in this life are never perfectly and totally fulfilled. We never have everything that we feel. We have everything we need, but we, we don't always have feel like we have everything we need. And therefore, when people relate to us, we want from them. We desire from them, even demand and expect from them. And God doesn't, ever. He gives to you. You don't have to give anything back. Simple as that. When you do, see, in that type of freedom, when you do give something back to God, just because you want to, just because you love him, you want to be part of what he's doing, that's precious to him. But people who give out of out of law or to get something from God, he doesn't care for that at all. Now, God is complete within himself, needing nothing, overflowing with goodness, love, and joy. This goodness, love, and joy is a result of his inner perfections. Now, he knows what, that what he is doing will turn out to be exactly the way in what he wants it to be. Well, that's the amazing thing about him. He set his, sets his mind to do something, and he can make it become what he wants it to become. You know, this experiment that he's doing with the angels and mankind, this fallen state business, is really interesting to me. Uh, because he doesn't run everything in the universe that way. He doesn't run the angels that way. They're pretty much regimented. They're in a fixed state. They can't fall or be saved, it looks like. Now, we still can. You know, the mankind still can. Now, once you're saved, you're saved. You can't fall from that. But you can grow, you can retrogress, you can become spiritually advancing, or you can become reversionistic. You know, there's a lot of options there. So... Now, the relationship enjoyed by the three members of the Trinity demonstrate for us a perfect model for unconditional relating. They just give to each other. They overlook each other. They are ready for each other. They, they have no unrealistic expectations for each other. They, they know who they are. They know what to expect. They let the other members of the Trinity live out there, you know, do their thing. And, and, and they have arranged it so when the Holy Spirit does his thing, that it fits perfectly within the team. They're a team. When it says they're one, I don't pretend to understand the Trinity, and I'm not going to get too deep into that because I don't understand how three can be one unless three is a unit. Maybe what he's saying is a unit. The three together make a unit. So, now secondly, in eternity past, when God devised the divine decrees, it's actually a divine decree. It's just one one decree. 
he decided to make his happiness available to it, to those who would learn how to access it. Access it. That's the amazing thing about God. Everything that God offers to the human race, he offers it freely. No strings attached. You just have to learn how to access it, how to use it, the conditions under which he gives it to you. You know, you just have to learn the system that God has set up, the relationship that he wants to have with you, and enter into it. And the, and the reward is there. The blessings that are already created. Ephesians 1, three says the first thing God ever did uh, was create our blessings before he even created the universe. He created our blessings held him in an escrow, waiting on us to be born, waiting us to reach this point in your life for the blessing, that particular blessings for today, 9, 13, 20, uh, 2020. Those blessings have already been released. They are coming and hitting your life just as you need them, perfectly timed. The blessings for tomorrow have not been released yet. They'll be released sometime tonight, and they will come, and they will hit your life exactly when you need them. One day at a time. Give us this day our daily bread. That's how it works. It's a one day at a time deal. So, but God decided to make his happiness available to everyone who would learn how to access it. Access it. So, his happiness comes from his thinking and perspective about life. The way God thinks about everything is what gives him joy. You see, God knows that everything's going to work out exactly the way it's supposed to. And that gives you a great advantage when you understand that everything that you want and desire is connected to something real in the plan of God. And you may have it confused about exactly what that means or what this desire in you actually is. You may think it's one thing when it's really another, but but I'm here to tell you that that desire that the Spirit is putting in there and connecting up with your beliefs and all is pure. It's pure. I mean, you say, no, it's corrupted. I've got it connected to so many bad things. Okay. Well, we got to disconnect that. You got to undo that, undo those connections so that your desire isn't hooked up with those, attached to those things anymore. And you got to detach it. And then you got to reattach your desire to the Lord and whatever the Lord has for you. But listen, the fact that you have that desire and you've attached it to anything at all indicates that you're alive, that you know what's going on, that you have enough left, enough, enough sensitivity left in you to be aware that you are desiring, that you do want. And now you can, you can disconnect from those wrong things and reconnect with God. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for somebody to, to connect with him, to listen to him, to adopt his way of thinking, to look at things from his perspective. You know, and on Wednesday night, you know, those of you that are with us, we're discussing how to get rid of that old, those old persistent, very persistent ideas. I mean, it used to, to me, I thought it was going to be so simple. You just learn the principles of the Word of God, and boom, you got it. Well, I discovered it's not quite that simple. It's not that simple. And that's that was very discouraging for a long time. Because I thought, here we've got it. You know, we're at the, you know, we found the magic uh, you know, rub the rub the genie lamp, you know, procedure, and everything's gonna be okay. Well, come to find out that's not all. But this thing we're doing on Wednesday night, that is all. That's the deal. That's the deal. So, God, God's joy comes from his happiness. I mean, his happiness and joy comes from his thinking, the way he thinks about it. He knows it's all going to turn out good. We share his happiness when we are freed from our human viewpoint ideas about life and adopt his way of thinking. Simple stuff. But getting free from our old program, that's the booger bear. That's the difficulty. That's what takes the sweat and tears. And that's the journey. And Ron and I are here to help you with that journey. 
We love to do that. That's our joy, is to help people with that journey. Now, thirdly, God only shares his happiness with those who are part of his family, believers only. You know, I find myself wanting to share these ideas with unbelievers. And they just look at me. You know, they're like, okay, whatever you're talking about, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to be polite and just let it go. And so they're just polite and they let it go by. And, and the next thing you know, you really have lost the connection with this person uh, because you're trying to give them doctrine that applies to believers only. Unbelievers have no kind of, no relationship with God, although they may talk about God all the time. They don't have a connection if they don't believe in Jesus Christ. So, Principle four of God's happiness, sharing God's happiness. He shares his happiness with believers who are mature in his grace, who are learning to use the divine assets that they have in Christ to remove their their ungodly or non-godly ways of thinking and embrace the mindset of Jesus and his humanity. And let me say all that again. God, listen, your ha God's happiness starts to form in you. This joy, it starts with peace. This assurance that you, it's not going to fail. God's plan is not going to fail. You're not going to be left out. You're not going to be left in the lurch. You know, that's why in Hebrews 13, 5, he says, stop worrying about the money. Stop focusing on money. You know, he says, remove this thing of the love of money and greed. He said, you've got to get that out of your head. You don't need this money. You know why? Because I will never leave you nor forsake you. I. You know, I said this morning, I taught the lesson at doctrinal studies uh, that God led him into the desert in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He said, I led you out there to to humble you. I let you get hungry so that I could feed you with manna. And he said, I led you into the desert to humble you, to reveal, to show what was in your heart, whether you would obey me or not. And I said, you know, we realized this was not for God to see what was in their hearts. He knew. He already knew what was in their heart. It was for them to see. The situation that you're in right now in your life is for you to see you, not your mate, not your partner, not your friend, not your kids, not Trump, you know, or Biden or the Democrats or anything else. It's for you to see you, period. That's what it's for. It's for you. You're in the desert to reveal you. Now, and then he goes on to say, I let you get hungry and I fed you with manna that you didn't understand. So that you might know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of the mouth of God. And here, what that means is we don't live by the physical bread, the earthly bread, the earthly retirement, the earthly finances, the earthly money. That's not, that's not how we live. He says the promises that come out of God's mouth that we have of being provided for every single day, even if we're in the desert with all of our family. And we have no food and water. And there are four million of us. And there's no animals. There's no water. There's no food. There's no anything. We know that God will provide. God will provide everything we need to do his mission. He said, well, what if he lets me die? Then you go to heaven. That's God's prerogative. That's his job. He determines all those things. So, God's happiness begins to form in us like a peacefulness. And then this assurance grows into a certainty. As you see God performing in your life and coming through for you and making a way for you, protecting you, you know, when you didn't even know it, this certainty begins to form in your soul. You know, and then you're peaceful, you're confident, you got you got confidence about your future. And as you and as though all that begins to form in you. It's really under the surface, and you don't even see it, maybe for a long time. And then you realize, you know, I don't know there's much that could shake me now. I think I'm pretty st stable in this. I'm pretty steady in this trust in God. And it's a really neat thing.
And this is what enables you to come to this plus H. It's not from circumstances. It's just from who you are in Christ and this relationship you have with him and the promises that he's made that you're going to, he's going to keep you. You're going to be with him. He's going to take care of everything. And you're finally beginning to really, really believe that. Paul said, I've been persuaded. That's what it takes. God will persuade you. All right. You got to grow into maturity. You got to learn how to use who you are in Christ and the divine assets, confession of sin, walking in the spirit, learning how to attach your desires and your faith to the right things, to detach your faith from the wrong things. That's an incredible, incredible uh, mechanical system to be able to look within yourself and see where you've attached your faith and to what you've attached your faith, which will amaze you how ridiculous it is, the things that you have believed in your life, especially when you were young. You're like, how could I ever have believed that? Well, you were a kid and you were confused. Now you got to go back and undo that and stop believing that because you're still believing some of the silly things you believed as a kid. Something bad happened and you thought, well, it was my fault. It was like, how could it be your fault? No, it was my fault. I know it was. It was me. You know, I must have somehow did something wrong and therefore all of this happened and this blew up and you know, dad left or whatever. It was all on me. You grow up thinking that crazy stuff. You know, you make some mistake early in life and you live 50 years of your life thinking that God is ashamed of you, that he's angry with you. It's like you you believed it when you were a little kid and you put that in your heart and it just stayed in there all these years. You know, and, and you maybe you've been upright and going through the motions, but deep down in your heart, you've been ashamed. You're like, how did I do that? How could I let myself do that? You were a kid. No excuses for anything. You don't need an excuse. You've been forgiven. You don't need to justify anything or keep it covered up. You're forgiven. It's been it's been reviewed in the courtroom of heaven. It's been all the details have been been determined and gone through. And the and the judge went, boom, you're forgiven. No need to keep that stuff hidden anymore. You know? And yeah, I'm not saying you gotta go tell everybody the stupid things you've done in your life, the 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 things that you don't want people to know about. I understand that. You know, and I'm not saying you need to tell everybody about them. I'm just saying you need to deal with them between you and God. And this is the this is the taking off stuff. This is where you get completely honest. See, you can't have joy. Here's a key for some of you. You know, you're still using self-deception. You're still keeping your grief and your hurt and your pain at bay. You keep it over here, out of the way, and you just you stay you stay over here and you go through the motions of doing the right thing. But deep down, you don't really have joy. You can't let people in to connect with your heart. You can't do it. Because in order to do that, you got to let down the wall. Or at least make a door in the wall. You know? And you'd be smart to make a door in that wall that keeps everything over there uh, at the pain. Make a door in that wall and let the Lord, you know, into that place. You go in there with him and clean that thing out. You know, your old man clothes closet, Jim Bertel calls it. You'd be smart to do that, but you can't open up. You shut down that whole thing. Your emotions are shut down, and you can't have joy with your emotions shut down. Can't do it. Let me tell you, there's a thing about medication that came up this last week. Some of you are on medication to keep you from over-emoting, and I understand that. You need to talk with your doctor. If you say, well, I, I really want to, Go through this process of undoing this numbness. Talk with your doctor. You know, discuss it with this person, uh, and 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 get good advice about it. I I will give you my opinion about it. Uh, my opinion is that if you're gonna t if you're gonna stop using the medicine, you do it slowly. Uh, but that God ultimately is the arbiter of your soul. He's the one that he's the phys great physician. Now, if, if you're someone who struggles with a brain disease, schizophrenia, true bipolar, 
you know, this is something that uh, these things are really, these are real maladies and medicine helps you stay within some boundaries uh, of behavior, even with those difficulties. So I would probably not suggest, especially schizophrenia, uh, if you suffer with that, that you get off your medicine. So I, I'm not giving you that advice. Now, saying you want to learn to feel again. you got to learn to feel again. By feeling, you feel your pain and you can feel your joy. You know, you can feel the sadness of your life and you can look ahead and feel the joy of where you're headed. This is where happiness comes from. So God, who is far out ahead of us, has made divine provision for us to change. God has made provision for us to change. Grace is accessed by faith. We believe the promises and principles in the word. And you, we, we learn these things, we understand them, and we swallow them like in the Eucharist. We believe them. And when we believe them, they, they're metabolized into the soul. Now they're ready for use in your life. When we understand what God has caused for our future, for every believer, then we realize that it's going to be as good as it can possibly be. It's going to be difficult. Well, you're going to have a difficult time improving on what God has planned for us. I has not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, notice it's those who are love him in a committed way, that are committed to him in this life. They get the great rewards in the next. So this whole thing, man, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be great when you realize it and you can focus on it without being pulled away and distracted constantly by the details of life so that it drowns out your spiritual joy, your peace. That's when you begin to feel it, experience it. So the believer's unhappiness, and let's talk about unhappiness. You say, I know these things, I believe these things, but I can't get away from this negativity. I can't get away from it. It's there. No matter what, I, when I wake up, it's there. When I go to bed, it's there. Listen, I understand this. I have a great deal of that that I struggle with in my life. Still do. Worked a lot of it out, got rid of a lot of it so that it's really lightened and lightened and lightened my load so that I can laugh, I can cut up, I can play, I can have a good time. You know, when, when things are really funny, I can laugh from all the way down in here. You know, I'm not bound up. You know, and that's just because of this process, not because there's anything great about me. I just, the Lord taught me how to undo these tangled up ideas out of the world that I'd been operating on that turned into habits that, that controlled my life and kept me from feeling anything. Started getting rid of that stuff. and Boy, everything started to come alive. But believers' unhappiness is caused by continuing to be dominated by old man beliefs that that base happiness on circumstances. Now, what is it you have, what is it you want in your life that you do not have? I mean, is it the love of a person? And you want somebody to love you in a certain way? Look, the way God loves you is, is what will fulfill you. Except here's the problem, and, and, and you know that. You know that God is the greatest lover of your soul that ever was or ever will be. And you know that he loves you, that he adores you. He wants to be right, connected to you as tight as possible. He loves you, but you want something different than that. You go, I know that's great. It's the greatest thing in my life, but that doesn't satisfy me. There's something else I've decided to want, and that is to be in that intimacy with another human being. I still look for that. I still yearn for that and long for that. I still want that. See, you, you've believed. See, and, and that's a legitimate thing. The soul got, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. God made human beings to be partners, to be mates. So we're supposed to mate up. And, and yes, and that person's not supposed to ever take the place of God, but they are supposed to have a, a part of your heart. 
but we give them we we decide that they're supposed to have the the lion's share of our heart that the love that we have with this human being is is what will bring happiness instead of the lord and what you have to do i mean and if you look at it you will find that most people or many people are in that situation they know the truth they know that god loves them and they love god but they will love somebody else more and they want somebody else's love more so listen they have to undo that belief they have to undo it that belief is not true you don't need that love from that other human being more than you do god's love you don't you just believe you do so all right, the old man beliefs are built around seeking human happiness based on better situations. When we get in a better situation, we'll start giving to the church. When we get into a better financial situation, we'll start giving to missions. You know, we'll start, we'll send a little money to that preacher on the internet. When we get in a better situation, let me tell you, there is no better situation. When happiness is based on increasing your human happiness, your circumstances, your sense of well-being will go up and down with whatever you consider to be your the positive events of your life. You will look back on the things that happened that you went, oh, that was fun. Boy, I felt so good. And then the next day, you're back down again. Oh, shoot. I had a flat tire on the way to work. You know, I was late. When I got it changed, I was speeding, and the cop gave me a ticket. You know, when I pulled in, the boss was angry with me. On and on we go. We say, I had a bad day. No. You had a day where the Lord allowed a lot of adversity to show you what was in your heart, to show you, to so, to show you that, that your frustration is not because of your circumstances, it's because of something in you that is reacting to your circumstances. What is that that's in you? See, that's what that's what all the adversity was about. Now, but when you base your joy, your happiness on, on what's happening in your life, your circumstances, your situations, your relationships, then you go up and you go down. You go up and you go down. And that's not really a good way. That's not plus H. That's a form of human happiness. So you're a believer with all the divine assets, and I'm not fussing at you. This is just where we are. This is where, this is how human beings are trapped. All of us are trapped in this circumstantial system where we think having more or something better, something different, will bring about happiness in our life. Circumstances. Situations. So, only by rejecting this way of thinking and removing these ideas from your soul will you have room for the new man beliefs to take place. If you find yourself consistently unhappy, and you're happy, you're, you're a little happy, and then you're bad, you're unhappy. You're a little happy, and you're unhappy. You know, and you're not sure why. You say, well, I know so much doctrine, I should be stable by now. But I'm not. Well, it means you still got your heart connected up to these circumstantial issues because they go up and they go down. You know, it looks like everything's going to work out. Everything's falling into line. Everything's falling into place. Boom. No, it didn't work out. Now you're like that. Your, your hopes are dashed. You're like uh, discouraged all over again because you got your hopes up on some circumstantial issue. When, you, when, when what you're trying to accomplish doesn't seem to be working, then look for something else. Be patient with the Lord. Stick in there. Hang on like a loose tooth, but be willing to change and look at something else. So you gotta, you got to reject the beliefs and the ideas. you got to detach your desires from the circumstantial issues of your life. Just see, you know, it's like a suction cup. Just pull it off. Reattach to the Lord. Only the beliefs used by Jesus in his earthly life will allow us to develop his way of thinking and therefore his happiness. 
Now, he operated under the old covenant when we're in the new covenant. We're under the church age. And so, therefore, we have a different way of operating. But the way that he thought about his life, his love for his father, his love for the spirit, his love for mankind, his willingness to sacrifice himself for our sake, those things that were in his heart, the way he valued us, the things he did, I, Sandra Malone, uh, the things he did on our behalf, having that same kind of mindset, this giving, unconditional loving and giving and sharing and giving all, giving it all. He didn't, he didn't save anything. Jesus didn't have a savings account of any kind. He didn't have an emotional savings account, a circumstances savings account, a financial savings account. This guy just gave it all every single day, trusting the Lord that the next day, whatever he needed was, would, would be there was already there. So you want to be able to, we want to be able to get rid of our old ways, our old things that have trapped us in this unhappy place where we're still unhappy because this happened or that happened. You know, it's been years now, but I'm still sad about this. I'm still sad about that. We've not been willing to take that head on and see that we're not thinking God's thoughts about that issue. We're still clinging to these false ideas. You know, if only that hadn't happened. If only, you know, my mother and father were still here. If only this, if only that. See, circumstances, situations. This is what this is what the human, the sinful old man belief system uses as the basis for happiness is circumstances, the things that we have or don't have. So you have to unhook yourself from those ideas and reattach your beliefs to the Lord. Not an easy, not an easy journey, but it's doable and it has to be done. So number six, God's happiness is experienced on a spectrum. We talked about you're either really miserable or really happy, somewhere in between. God used, Number seven, God uses our desire to share his happiness to drive us to maturity. This is what God uses to move us, to drive us. See, we're motivated by desire. He put this empty spot in our heart, in our the core of our being, this poilos, this empty hole. And this is where the hunger and thirst comes from, the longings for the good things in life. And that's what drives us to fill that up. We try to stuff everything in the world in there, people, you know, our marriage, our kids, uh, our career, our situation, the respect of our neighbors, the respect of the people in our life. You know, we're dignified and we handle ourselves a certain way because we just have to have that respect. You know, we, we try to stick all kind of stuff in that hole when really only the Lord can go there. So uh, this desire that's in us from that hole is what drives us in our life. And it drives us to reach this place of maturity. And listen, when you start feeling peace, the peace of God that passes understanding because you're growing, you're developing, you're beginning to really trust God and you start to get this peace not that cut, not that's up and down, but it's just kind of stable. Boy, that's really a, uh, that's a great feeling, a great state to be in, and it motivates you to move forward, to go deeper, to go farther with the Lord. And the deeper you go, the stronger that gets. It turns into confidence. You know, it turns into certainty that God will do what He said, that He will honor His promises to you. Just a certainty, and that certainty is what gives you this this play this security this this sense of I've got it everything's going to be all right you see happiness and contentment comes from knowing it's going to be okay wow what a wonderful thing to know and to believe and be certain about it's going to be okay everything you know why god has got it under control and listen he loves me he loves you. He cares about you. 
He's got it under control. He's got all the power in the world. He has all the assets in the world. You know, nothing can touch him. Nothing can defeat him. And he loves you. And he's put you, made you part of the body of Jesus Christ. He's adopted you into his own family. He's get, made you a citizen of heaven. And he loves you. And he can do anything. Huh. And he's good. He's righteous. He's holy. You know, he's loving. He's giving. And he loves you. He wants to bless you. You just got to learn. See, he's already done it. All this stuff is just sitting there in our life. It's like we're sitting in our living room with all these great blessings sitting there on the table by us, and we don't even see them. We don't even know they're there. We don't even realize that he's given these things to us already. It's when we begin to really grow up and see these things and pay attention. I can't tell you how important paying attention to what's going on in your own mind is listening to what you're saying to yourself. If there's anything I could encourage you to do is, is for you to start listening to what you are saying to yourself. Do it today. Do it today. All right. We've got four minutes. I, the, let, let me get a couple more things. So as we grow, our desire for happiness changes to love for him. I mean, we still want to be happy. We start to be happy. We start to be happy in a way that it'd be difficult to change. Now, you know, things happen. You know, there's some things in our life that that really, you know, things, losses, big losses, you know, those are things that would shake you or hurt you uh, or grieve you no matter how mature you were. Jesus was grieved. But you're, you're in this place of stability, of stable happiness because you've grown and you've let go of so many of these things that, that were important to you, that you had attached yourself to, your faith and your, your desire, you'd attach to all these things. I want this, I want that, I've got to have this, got to have... No, I'm letting all that go. I'm detaching that, I'm unhooking that stuff. It's like they get all these hooks in you and these lines pulling you into the world. You know, and every time you let go of the Spirit, it just pulls you into the world, pulls you into your sadness or your depression or your discouragement, or your anger, or your frustration, or you're into your lust, you know? You say, well, I got money. I'll just go do whatever I want to do. So the world pulls you into it, and you just go with it. And that's your distraction from the reality of, of who you are in Christ and dealing with the adversities of your life. Finally, when you start unhooking that stuff from the world, you, you're able to turn and face the Lord and the real issues of your life. And, and get some answers and come to these places where you resolve these things. You no longer believe that. You no longer care about that. You no longer want that. But now you're, it's replaced with a love for God, a desire to be with him, a desire to please him. You know, so the desire to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Your joy slowly grows, especially as you lay aside deep grief and pain that you've not fully resolved. These things you've stored in your heart, you know, somebody that you loved for all your heart and soul died, and now your heart is still connected to them. You haven't been able to let them go, and your life is, is one of grieving. You say, well, it's been years, and I should have been able to let them go, and now I'm ashamed of myself, and I feel I feel dumb because I haven't, and all I see, it just compounds itself. God wants you to undo all that and let that go and stop feeling bad because you're struggling with it, but also to accept his will in this matter and to see that his will is good. He says, count it all joy. Rejoice when the adversities come in your life because they're, they're for your growth. They're for his glory. This is what this is how it works. And listen, one of us is next. One of us is going next. You know, wouldn't mind if it was me. I just got too much to do. It's like the old song said, I love St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company stove. So with that we'll close. Uh it's six o'clock. I'm really grateful for y'all coming and listening to to these ramblings. Uh, I hope they're helpful to you. 
please send me some feedback if you have questions, you know, anything like that. Go to the website, arministry.net. Uh, that's alrondaministry.net. And, you know, subscribe if you will. There's a place to donate if you want to. And uh, we'll see you next week. Father, we love you. We're grateful for these ideas. I pray, Father, that you let me complete this study on happiness, that I don't have to do another one, but I know I will. So we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.